the only reward for uh, good work is more work. Mm-hmm. We need to grow faster and grow better and, and scale this business even more. And uh, I'm not resting for a moment. Uh, yeah. We're trying to grow the team uh, significantly. We're trying to reach as many customers as we can and become this, the leader in the space. I think we already are the fastest growing company in the security space. But uh, in order to maintain that, we need to work very hard. Welcome to the latest episode of Tech Self Cross uh, with me, your host, James Hounslow. Um, and today uh, I'm delighted to have Leo Yari uh, on the show. Leo, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you, James, for having me today. No worries at all. So, uh, Leo, you are co founder and CEO of Gripe Security. Uh, recently uh, announced some, um, some great news of, of funding, which we'll go into in, um, in some detail. Um, shortly um but really excited to hear about your journey and who you are and before we before we get going i always ask uh, my guests just to give uh, a little background as to uh, as to who they are yeah thank you james so uh Leo, i am the ceo and co-founder of rep security as you said it, it's funny that we we talked today we just uh two days ago announced our 41 million dollar b round which is a it's a big big uh, event for us yeah uh, and a, a big show of trust in the company which uh I'm really appreciative for because we've been working very hard over the last two and a half years to make it happen. So uh, Drip is a SaaS identity risk management solution. We've raised uh, $66 million in the last two and a half years since we founded the company. Uh, and it's been an amazing journey to work with, with amazing people on my team. Uh, so we're going strong. Uh, for myself, I started doing cybersecurity at, uh, at the age of 16. I was doing... Um, homework for NYU students as a high schooler in Israel. That was a, a weird gig I find myself on. Uh, did my first cyber course uh, as, an, as an NYU training, funny enough. Um, then worked for the Israeli uh, military doing cyber security for, for a pretty long time. Jumped between a few startups and ended up being the CTO at YL Ventures, which is one of the biggest uh, cyber focused investors globally. Uh, they were just ranked six in the world in investor returns. Uh, for the third fund, which is uh, amazing. It's, it's yeah. you know, there's tens of thousands of VCs out there, the, one of the top 10 in terms of the ability to invest and being the CTO of one of the biggest um, cyber investment fund gets you a lot of exposure into, into the market, something you cannot get anywhere else. With the one caveat that uh, you start getting jealous of all of those people, um, you know, fulfilling their ideas, building, building cyber companies. So, um, after about a year um, of, of investing or not investing in startups, depending on who approached us, uh, I've decided to leave Wild Ventures and build a company in one of the hottest spaces that we wanted to invest in. Um, yeah. Luckily for all of us, they, they thought it's a, it was a good idea as well. So they let us see down about two weeks after I've left. Uh, then a, a round about six months after that uh, with Intel Capital and now $41 million with Third Point Ventures. I'm based in Boston, moved here out of Israel, uh, obviously found the company in Israel. I, I hope everyone can hear my accent uh, in those first few minutes, but I'm very excited to be here today. Awesome. Uh, lots to unpack um, uh, in that, what you've what you just spoken about. First of all, I'd like to, to understand then, you never really thought about setting your own tech company up until you joined a VC and got exposure to that? No, I wouldn't say that. I think uh, I'm coming from a very um, startup aware background. One of my, my most impressive statistics, it's not my statistic, it's just my, my background. When I joined the military, um, we were a high class, amazing people team, nine people in the team today. Five of them are startup founders. Uh, one, one already uh, sold this company in, in 2021 and we raised $130 million uh, to companies of this, you know, one small team that worked together in 2013. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we're going to top, up, top that this year. Uh, we've already raised with 50, 51, uh, but there's more to come. Nice. Love it. So, um, what led you to YL Ventures then? So you were so so you'd been in working for startups. What led you into taking on a a seat uh, a CTO role? So you were the CTO role within this uh, yeah. YL. 
So uh, working for a startup, I was a um, project lead uh, doing automotive security or automotive vulnerability research. We were working with some of the biggest brands uh, that everyone is well familiar with. You can see them on the road, uh, helping them build secure vehicles uh, from, from a cyber perspective. And it was a fascinating job. The only problem is that vulnerability research and automotive are, are very far away from uh, startups or the startup mentality. Yeah. Like the people you sell to, the type of companies you meet, didn't. At, at some point, I, I've realized, you know, trying to calculate back if and when I, I want to be a startup founder, it was a question. There was no answer of whether I want to do it, but I thought it might be the case. All the cool keys of building a startup those days. Uh, especially in 2019 and then in 2020 when I left. And I wanted to to make a career jump that would get me much closer to startups. Mm -hmm. uh, one of it just wasn't on the table back then. I called my my past commander, who's now the, a CEO at an AI company, uh, and, and told him, like, I'm, I'm open to ideas of how can I get closer to the startup industry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that I wasn't close, but I wanted to be you know, in the weeds of what's happening in the in the scene. And the following day, he, he met with one of the partners with Wild Ventures for a chat. Uh, and two weeks after that, it was a perfect world, exactly what I wanted. And looking back, honestly, one of the best uh, career decisions I've made as well. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing the one thing I realized in Wild Ventures pretty fast is that I, I wonder if, if this interest in startups is an external or internal thing. Is it all of the cool kids are building companies and I, I want to be like them? Or is it something I really want to do? And what you realize pretty fast is the answer is definitely yes. Awesome. Um, what I'd like to understand um, is for you to give a brief over is why do you think YL Ventures are so successful in, in, in what they're doing? Because it's, it's, it's easy to get a fluke of a couple of things. But to have the repeated, consistently success in the VC world is a is a huge challenge, and is one they're obviously getting right time and time again. And then, what was your what was your role to what were you doing on a day to day basis for them? Yeah, so what I mentioned is an am amazing partner for us. I'm, I'm not working for them anymore, so this okay. is a it's more honest than it was in 2020 when I get the same talk. But what they've realized is that they they wanted to become. Uh, best in the market. Mm -hmm. And as a VC, it's something that's very hard to do. Most VCs you know, don't make good returns for the investors, almost by definition. Only the good ones are doing well. Um, in order for them to become high-end, they wanted to become hyper-specific. So it's a US-based VC with a big Israeli office because they only invest in Israel, mm -hmm. only invest in cyber, and only as a first check. Well, many VCs try to spread their investments to manage the risk when they try to invest in different stages, not to give up on opportunities. Wild Ventures realized that if, if they will be best in class, they'll be able to attract the best founders. And as a founder, I can say it's, it's the founders that make the VCs, not the VCs that make the founders. Yeah. But being high end allows you to make sure you can invest when you give out an offer to the best teams out there, they're going to say yes even in a lower valuation, even with a smaller brand. So in cyber specifically, which is kind of the edge edge of Israel, you buy a Belgian um, chocolate, Swiss watches and Israeli cyber. Yeah, yeah. They're hyper-focused here. When the biggest challenge of Israeli, Israeli founders is that there's no market in Israel. They need to sell in the US. Wild Ventures wanted to build that bridge. So they have a, a vast network of uh, CISO advisors, most of them out of the Fortune 500s, that help them both understand what they should invest on. So for every due diligence call, for every consultant now, they can talk to top class, world class leaders in the cyberspace and understand if what they're presented by entrepreneurs is really a problem that those budget for. And on the other hand, when they invest in a company and they only invest two, three times a year, hyper-focus, yeah. they can pull in resources to take this company to market. Okay. So um, my role uh, as a CTO is part of the investment team. 
uh, which is a is a joint team that decides on investment opportunities and evaluates investment opportunities. But I had the say, technical authority and technical edge, and I would join every conversation between a CISO and a startup. There's, there's many of those every week as yeah. kind of a technical translator. So for the financial team, when a CISO and a, and a group of security entrepreneurs are talking, there's, there's some subtleties in the conversation that, that you need to help better understand from a financial, financial perspective. And then I would also say, will this idea work or not? How easy it is to copy? Is it something truly innovative? For me, I've a fantastic experience. So something the fact that you're clearly a very intelligent person, um, you have to be to get into the military and do what you do within the military, and it's kind of a given in where you are. How valuable in building a startup to where it is do you put down to the experience that you've had with a number of conversations with different founders within um, that community to help shape you build um, your organization grip? So, you know, I can only talk about my experience that the better entrepreneurs that, uh, that had less experience when they started and the worst entrepreneurs that had more. Yeah. Um, for me, it's it's funny looking back and asking, uh, what, what was Wild Ventures a helpful step, helpful step in my career building a startup? It's an easy answer. It's definitely yes. Yeah. Um, but I, I think for entrepreneurs specifically, when you when you think of the classic background or the classic recommendations, it's usually go and work for a startup before you build your own. The, the reason for that is that the things you see uh, working for a startup, the challenges you meet on a daily basis are replicable. You see them everywhere. And knowing that there's going to be problems that you need to overcome definitely helps building a company. When you, when you work for a VC, you don't get that experience. But what you do get is a big impact on how to find the right idea. Yeah. So startups fail, like most startups fail because they run out of money. Yeah. And the best way not to run out of money is to have a, 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 a the right go to market and market fit. And while working for a startup, you can see challenges in scale, in recruitment, in working with design partners. For me, working for Wild Ventures was an amazing experience in understanding how to build a solution that the market wants. And, and if you ask me why is Grip the best SaaS security company, um, and I've personally evaluated a lot of SaaS security companies in my time at Wild Ventures, is because we always felt the entrepreneurs don't get what the customers really need, but what is technically possible or technically cool. Yeah. So we'll come on to that. Um quite shortly when we when we start hearing about uh, Grip and my voice, but at what point did you realize that there was an opportunity um, to build a company and the problem that you decided you wanted to um, to solve? Uh, so as I said, Grip is a SaaS identity risk management solution. We, we see how every business today uses SaaS as, as kind of an operation system. Uh, marketing and sales and, and DevOps and finance and security, all of them are using SaaS applications to do everything that they do. Back in 2020, when we prioritized internally in Wild Ventures, SaaS is one of the biggest uh, spaces that, that is looking for innovation. We saw two conflicting trends. One, the traditional solution for, for SaaS, CASB, the one that started in, in 2013, was I'd say underwhelming or unpopular. So ranked at the bottom five of unpopular solution in cyber. At the same time, ranked at the top five of fastest growing markets in cyber. So you, you have an unpopular solution that's um, growing really fast, which is a discrepancy that, that means there's some room for innovation here because if you have a popular solution, it could match the speed of the unpopular one. The second thing, the second trend that we were looking for, we were looking for high interest problems, problems that customers are always willing to hear more about, not necessarily to pay, but to hear more about, that 
have the trajectory of becoming a budget line item or a budget category. If you look back to cloud security, cloud security started as a problem, or Kubernetes security started as a problem, or people are like, I have this cloud thing and I'm interested in learning what, what my problems are. And now we came into a budget line item, a budget category, and you see the space exploding. With SaaS, especially in 2020 when COVID started, but even before that, there's this constant growth of number of applications, of how enterprises are adopting them, the type of enterprises that adopt SaaS from you know, SMBs to then enterprise to finance. Everyone is using SaaS today. And, and in 2020, everyone also realized that employees are, are not going to go back to the office. And even if they do, work culture is going to change in a way where most of the time spent is going to be in front of a browser using third-party applications. So everyone was willing to talk about it. No one had budget. And we assume that's going to change over time. Um, we created the opportunity. That, if the question is when I realized that I, I need to build something myself is, is when we didn't find something to invest in. I'll say, luckily for me, I, I wouldn't have made a lot of money from uh, investing in a, in a SaaS security company. Uh, I like doing it myself, and I, and I love this problem space. So I, I fell in love with the problem space, and it's made sense for everyone to, for me to do it. I love it. The, the thing, when, when you lose technology to solve a problem, a real problem, um, that's when you, you can go on a, on a proper journey. Um, you're, you're two, just over two and a half years into the journey. Um, there's been some obviously great success um, uh, at the top of that is obviously receiving the, um, uh, the funding uh, this week. What's been the biggest unexpected challenge that you faced as a founder and a CEO um, over those first um, few years? The most unexpected challenge, I, I could, you know, make it sound like there's only one. <laughs> um, so the most important thing for founders is the flexibility to face problems they haven't faced before. Yeah. And and from my perspective, I'm, I'm the only one in the company that doesn't has have experience in his job. Uh, yes. uh, sales or marketing or customer success or developers or they, they, they all did it before they before they can jump on, on board to do it full grip. Um and it means we're we're constantly facing new things that, that we need to overcome. I think my focus, you know, I wasn't a salesperson, I was a marketing person, but this wasn't an unexpected challenge. Yeah. I think for us building a culture of a multinational company is so it's something that's hard to plan for in the early beginning. Um, it's easy to forget in the early beginning because we started as an Israeli company and we've branched out and, and became an international company. We're not an Israeli company anymore, even though I'm originally from Israel or we have a big office in Israel. Because if we were an Israeli company, we wouldn't be able to scale how, how our culture into a global company. So this big change that we're focusing on and, and spent the last year and a half doing is something that uh, we needed to adapt to. Love that. And I guess part of that, a big part of that is yourself putting your hand up and uh, and moving to, uh, to Boston. Um, one of the biggest questions and conversations that I have with early stage founders at seed stage, when do I bring in my first salesperson and when does a VP of sales arrived? How did you decide when you were going to bring in outside sales? And where did you bring them in? Did you bring them in in North America, in Israel? What was your plan? Mm -hmm. So looking back, we didn't realize how badly do we need to build a sales organization. Yeah. We had some certain luck. Uh, one of my friend's companies uh, was sold for, uh, for a large amount. I got three phone calls the same day they announced the acquisition, and they told me, hey, you have to meet with one of our sales leader, leaders. Um, Drew, Drew Gantler is outstanding, doing an amazing job. But only when he joined, we, we, we kind of had, had an uh, opportunistic hire. We thought it was going to take us three months before we need sales. Only when he joined, I realized how wrong I was. 
Yeah. And one of the things that put the company on the right trajectory is this, this coincidence. Because very fast we realized that we need to start building the infrastructure for sales team, even though a month before that, we had no marketing, no sales. We, we hired a, a pretty large sales team for a small organization. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, you, you just cannot scale in time. So if, if you ask me, when do founders need to bring in their sales team? As at the first moment that there's projection to revenue. Yeah. I think some, some people wait on closing the first few customers, getting to the first half a million. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is that finding the right sales leader or the right people on the sales organization, training them, making them effective takes time. If you only start doing that when you have half a million dollars in revenue, you're losing three, four months of momentum where you could have had a compounding impact on the revenue. Yeah. So when the first quote goes out, even before it's signed, even if you just an offer, having a salesperson on board has a dramatic impact. 100%. Uh, and I guess that's one of the key um, parts of being a founder is being surrounded by the right people to help give you advice and guidance like that um, to show you because it, it, it is what sets, you know, the, the product is one thing, but the the sales organization is what enables your dream to actually happen and the speed of which it, it, it can happen um, as well. Um, outside of being introduced for your network, how have you found attracting and hiring salespeople? Well, attracting and hiring are different questions. Um, one one of uh, the disadvantage of the US being very big is that it's less uh, network impacted. Of course, we we heavily rely on, on building connections and meeting people and using our networks to reach out. But um, for us recruitment firms uh, such as yourselves, um, have a very big impact on our ability to hire quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I can uh, uh, give you the compliment here and, and say to any founder that is afraid of a recruitment fee, the cost of not having someone for another month is higher. Uh, and while people, I, I know lots of people are trying to maximize on the network before they're trying to branch out, it, it, it's not worth the risk. From our perspective, uh, you know, getting the right people faster have a really big impact on the company, and at the end of the day, our network is limited. Yeah. Um. So, so this has worked for us really well. I love that. Um. It's. I mean, it's. It's when you're growing, you need uh many irons in the fire, um, and it's utilize everything that you have to make sure that you're attracting the um the best people in there. Um. How old was the business when you first started showing it to clients? The business when we first started showing it to clients, uh, minus two and a half months. It's <laughs> you, it's, the, 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 the business is never too young to show it to clients. When we connected our first POC to a customer environment, the solution didn't have a dashboard. Yeah, we we sent them an Excel sheet with the findings. Um, and it, it's, it was one of the most smartest things we've done. I, I think it's kind of an obvious advice. I'm not, I, we invented the wheel when we say I build an MVP. Um, in, in Hebrew, the, the word uh, humiliating starts with an M. So there's an Hebrew saying the, 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 the M is in MVP is for humiliating. If, if you're proud of your MVP, you're doing something wrong. Like that, like that. Um You've decided to to go to um, to the US yourself. What was the thinking behind that? Because one of the one of the, the the struggles for Israeli startups is understanding the cultural setup, particularly of salespeople. And it'll be although they speak English, it's a different English. Um, so, what was the thinking behind making the decision to um, to go? It's it's a truly different culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know where the listeners are from, but, but Israel is a country in uh, the size of Rhode Island. The market in Israel is the size of Rhode Island. And it means that in order to build a company, you need to branch out. Um, and while Israel is very good culture-wise in finding design partners and willingness to innovate, um, 
in order to build a business, selling in the US is, is usually the go-to market for Israeli companies. It's big, it's a huge market, and it has a, a similar culture all across. Again, compared to Europe, which is uh, geographically closer, but built out of 25 different markets, yeah. um, you, can, you can build a repeatable business in the US. So the, the reason I moved here um, is built out of two things. One, we acknowledge that half of the company, at least, is going to be in the US. Uh, so as I said, we started as an Israeli company, but over time, the balance between our Israeli headcount and a US headcount will get to 50-50, and hopefully we'll have a bigger presence here. And I wanted to make sure that I have time to be with the team, build the team, and also show them that um, they're, not, they're not working remotely for a bunch of 28-year-olds uh, Israelis uh, that don't have foots on the ground. Uh, the second thing is that our biggest challenge is scaling. Uh, we needed to do that uh, when I moved, and we need to do that even faster now. In order to scale, uh, the business needs leadership where the customers are. So I'm here. Makes sense. What were the biggest learns you made in immediately of, of being there from, from not being a tourist, but actually living there and working there and understanding um, the culture that you might not have picked up if you hadn't done it? So any founders that are thinking of not coming um, and and maybe hiring a, a GM instead of coming over, what what could they miss? Even before uh, moving to the U.S., I, I was in the U.S. pretty often. But the ability to focus on what on what matters when you do this fifteen hours flight is is different than uh, the ability being here. So when you when you have to fly fifteen hours to do something, you you only get to the big things. You only come when there's a big event, when there's a big, large gathering in the company. Um, and being here gives me an opportunity to focus on the small things, on the personal lives of, of our employees and building a connections with them because they're, because they're in town, because we're traveling to the same place. Um, and as from a cultural perspective, in order to manage a U.S. team, you need to be part of the U.S. culture. Yeah. So me having the same uh, health insurance issues than, than uh, compared to my team is a big benefit as an example, comparing a free healthcare Israeli office to the challenges that they face today. Um, and the second thing is the ability to build a network and build connections over time accelerates dramatically when I'm here. Yeah. So just, just yesterday, I came back from a small conference in Austin. This is something I would never have traveled to from Israel. You know, I, I wouldn't travel for a small, cost in, a small, yeah. small conference in Austin. Just, just to meet a few customers. But when I meet the customers, I meet my team. I see them talking an event. I see them interact, and they see me as well. Um, and one of the best ways to to boost confidence in what we do is for them to see how passionate I am in building this um, amazing enterprise. I think it's so 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 critical. Uh, I think it's great you you you've done that. And um, before we hear about um, how you are going to put this investment to uh, to work in the uh, in the final stage of this uh, uh, this podcast, we've reached that point where you get to ask a recruiter anything you want. Um, is there something you've always wanted to ask a recruiter? Now is your time uh, to throw it in my direction uh, for me to answer. Yeah, so you know you you work a lot with Israeli startups and and connect them with the US sales team. I'm, I'm interesting. What are the like, cultural cultural mistakes entrepreneurs tend to make when interviewing their first uh, sales hires? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so there's a few that I can I can uh, pick up on. The first one is there's this a kind of arrogancy that people want to work for you, um, and there's this, an interrogation um on the first conversation about what that person has has done um instead of a you have to sell the organization the dream the thing that i have to keep saying about america is america is the land of opportunity for software salespeople. in israel there are some amazing businesses but there's also a lot of amazing business in america and and those people have got choices so it's realizing that 
yes, you are great, but this person, if they're good, they've got opportunity. So the the first call is always say is it's got to be a you've got to tell them why before it was you know going back sort of like um five ten years ago you know one of the staple questions of an interviewer was uh why do you want to join us and um which was a rubbish question anyway at the best times and now it should not even exist and you should be saying this is why you should be coming to join me this is why you need to come to our family um so that's a, a a big part um for the uh, for that first initial bit the second sort of like challenge from israeli tech companies is that sometimes they they look to rely too much on their network or try to look too close to find a business that's done well and hire someone who's worked in that business um and and that becomes a challenge because you you never know in your network if you've got the best person um and then also no one really knows why a company's done well unless you're inside it. Um, and, and hiring an, an, an employee from that business doesn't always mean that you're going to get the same success as um, as that. So those are the the, the, the couple of things that I've, that I've seen. But the um, but when interviewing, for sure, is knowing that um, you need to be selling and, and 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 talking about the company and where it's going, where it's been, and um, and where it's going. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think uh, a recruitment process is a bi-directional thing. Yeah. The, the balance changes along the process, I think. it's the, yeah. Most of the sale is on the candidate at the beginning and then on the yeah. company it's once they've decided they will be higher. Yeah, but, that's 100% uh, agree. That first bit is you get that buy-in. You, you'll get a an understanding as a leader when you're doing that this is how this person is taking it are they listening are they asking questions um so you'll get to know whether you want to take them on to the next part and then um that's when it kind of switches around a little bit and then obviously you put a test in at some point to make sure that you know they're the right person um for you um so exciting um the uh the cash has has, has barely hit the bank but what's next you know I, I guess you've been head down look raising funds is hard and it takes a lot away from the business um while you're in there and um, and doing it it's arrived um what's the plan where what will the business look like this time next year yeah so the the only reward for uh, good work is more work mm -hmm. we need to grow faster and grow better and, and scale this business even more and uh, you know i'm not resting for a moment uh, yeah. We're trying to grow the team uh, significantly and we're trying to um, reach as many customers as we can and become this, the leader in the space. I think we already are the fastest growing company in the security space. But uh, in order to maintain that, we need to work very hard. And that's, uh, that's my intention. Love it. So at the moment, um, clients are predominantly in the US. Are you planning to grow more in, in Europe? Um, most of our focus is in the U.S. and it's going to stay on the U.S. Uh, for, for a while. We're selling in some other territories too, yeah. more of an opportunistic basis. But um, the U.S. is an amazing market to work with. It's awesome. it, it loves innovation. Uh, it, it, people here can put a very strong dollar ROI to everything that they do. Um, and, and, and the money speaks for itself for sure. compared to other markets that could be more hesitant or yeah. relationship-based. So for us, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity to be to be working here in, in America. And uh, we'll go here before we branch out. Love it. So tell me, um, since you've been in America, are you baseball, football, basketball, baseball? Where are you? What sport, sport are you landing on? Um, one of my best sales reps is a big, big sports guy. Yeah. And... One of the challenges I have going with him to events is that he, he knows all of the different teams for all of the different sports for every city in the U.S. When we meet the CSO, he would say, I, I grew in uh, Brownsville, Illinois. And he would say, oh, I know this team, this player left last season. He'll go into a 15-minute discussion um, about the last year's uh, baseball season. And I still I still don't know the rules. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm still unsure on how we play baseball, um, but it's something that culturally I need to I need to adapt to. So I'm, you know, well familiar with uh, with the Boston sports. That's a good start. Nice. And uh, all, over time, I'll get better and better. 
like it love it um laurie i really appreciate you taking time i know uh you have a, a hectic schedule at the best of times but um i know um our audience will really appreciate you taking time out particularly when you see the success that you've had people will want to be following in that path and just getting a small insight into how you've done it um they'll be really grateful for so thank you james i really appreciate the time today uh, and, and like working together so it's great to see you again awesome